La La Land is a series of five short games that was released by Matt Aldridge in 2006. I got pointed at them probably two or three years ago by Anna Anthropy on her blog, and they've stuck with me very powerfully just because of how strange and abstract and unnerving they are. I really like all five of them. Um, I think I played the second and third one first and then went back and played all, all five in a, in a row. Uh, because they capture a very weird sort of subliminal abstract storytelling that I don't see too often in games. And this game was doing it all the way back in 2006. And it's cool to see that because I feel like for a lot of these sorts of games, our collective memory as a community doesn't really stretch back before like 2008. Uh, I think that's when Braid came out. I think that's when Passage came out. And it's a shame because there was a lot of interesting stuff that came out before then. One of the ones that definitely I think of when I think of that is Cyclus, which predates games like Knit, which are just combatless exploration games. You kind of run around exploring and collecting things. But that game is very long, and La La Lands, all five are very short and incisive and they have very simplistic mechanics. It might look like I'm doing a lot on the screen right now, but as far as I can tell, shooting does nothing. Jumping is very... The movement around is random. The only thing I can do is move left and right, and jumping and shooting, which neither two don't really accomplish anything. And the goal is to get those lightning bolt things, but I think you can get up to 50 and then the game ends, but I'm going to cut it off now so we can move on to the next one, La La Land 2. It's pretty obvious right off the bat that this is a very different game from the first La La Land, and the other La La, game, La La Land games follow more in suit from this one, with more concrete characters and actual like dialogue, and this and the second one, this, this one and the third one are both feel a lot like fables, like specific little morality tales, except that it never really has a straight, it doesn't really have a straightforward moral. The straightforward moral of this game actually is very trite and bad in a way, but if you, if you just look at it like that. But there's a number of details that make me think that there's a little more to it than that. Like the obvious narrative here is that we're collecting the gold and from the rich and giving it to the poor and the poor is becoming greedy and stealing and doesn't actually deserve what we're doing and obviously that's just stupid that's not really a worthwhile story direction I don't think but there's a number of details that are strange to me there's the bigot kind of do oh the main character is bigot the um, bigot doppelganger in the background on the left screen that's crying yellow tears that fall into the pipes and then the poor people the rich people are like drinking the yellow tears so I think from that it's pretty obvious that this isn't just a straightforward uh, tale where the rich are being exploited by the greedy poor which is like I said obviously a trite message I feel like it's in especially in light of the later La La Land games I feel like this is more kind of about the main character being exploited by other people's forces and that this ending is a little less straightforward and more just kind of has weird satirical tinge to it. It's also probably important to note that um, a lot of my reading of these games is informed by an old blog post on this page called gamesthatexist.com I can't, I, I don't think it's actually online anymore. I had to go through archive.org to read about it. But it was a really interesting kind of reading of the games. It's more personal and based on uh, the experiences of the Avatar Bigot. Uh, this one is my other favorite of the La La Land games because, because it's very simple but still kind of weird to parse. Whereas um, the La La Land 4 it feels a lot, is a lot more convoluted and kind of cluttered compared to the first two and maybe the fifth one um, which makes parsing it a little less rewarding this one is just so kind of simple and fable like but trying to figure out exactly what it means is still very interesting and obviously all of the games are very dreary and kind of desolate as you can tell here 
and oof, this last beat is just especially chilling. And that's just the game. Then the game just cuts to black. That's it. <laughs> All right, moving on to La La Land Four. This one is again sort of a distinct stylistic departure from the last two, in that it is a much more. There are many more screens. There's a lot more going on in it. Um, but it kind of shares the same abstract storytelling. This is a very straightforward kind of gamey scenario here at the start. Is this little bit of puzzle platforming, but the little device of the foreground bit kind of makes it work, I think. And here's some like actual spoken dialogue, I think, for the first time. So I think that blog post I mentioned earlier uh, characterized this as bigots kind of having trouble with just having an actual job and just after dealing with more abstract problems in the previous episode. This one is another kind of straightforward video gamey puzzle is that how do you get past this guy? You just, okay, just go by it enough times. And again, we've already moved through like so many screens in comparison to the previous games. It's just moves through a lot more imagery. It's a very different style. And you can kind of see that more developed in stuff like Dysphoria later on, which is a bunch of different little micro scenarios that come together to form kind of a complete image. Um, this is the lone part of the series, I think, that has to do with romance, which is kind of a common theme for these kind of games, and especially people making fun of these kind of games. Like the stuff you see on Red Supreme a lot. But because it's La La Land, it's already taken a pretty desolate turn. And this is also where we see kind of another common motif in these games, and that's repetition. Just taking the same motion and building up, building it over and over again, maybe with escalating for dramatic effect. There's a lot of cool art that uses that technique that I think often gets, oh, new scenario, that I think often gets kind of dismissed for its use of repetition. Like another here is just an extended long sequence. Like one of my favorite cartoons is Revolutionary Girl Lutna, and that just is constantly repeating the same sequences and symbols and motifs and um, there's one minute and a half long sequence that gets repeated every other episode and people rag on repetition I think as an artistic device because it can feel monotonous or tedious and that is especially true in video games where that are supposed to be fun that are the opposite supposed to be the opposite of the tedious but in some cases I feel like repetition can be used to very powerful effect especially in games that aren't necessarily intended to be straightforward and fun. Um, this is another... Uh, one thing I noticed in this sequence for the first time is that that is a giant blown-up version of Bigot's face. I did not notice that the first time. And here's a motif that we'll get especially developed on in La La Land 5, and that's the um, dreaming, the sleep. And I believe that is the end of this episode. Yeah, another suitably dreary conclusion. Uh, I think all it does is just, um, at this point, I think it just, unlike the other ones, which cut to black, this one I had to actually click escape out of. All right, and now we're moving on to La La Land 5. So obviously, right off the bat, this one is setting an entirely, di entirely different mood than the previous La La Land games. Let's see, we can see how it progresses as the game moves on. Here we're moving back into the motif of sleep and also the motif of Bigot working a day job. Here he is selling Bibles to hungry fish to the, so that he can eat. And this is easily the, this is the Excluding the first one, which can stretch on a long time when you're trying to actually conclude it, this is the longest of the La La Land games, La La Land games, and it's also the most repetitious, which I think makes it the most challenging to try to appreciate because it um, repeats with a lot of the same scenes over and over again. And here we are, going back to sleep. 
Uh, but the music is a very different mood from the rest of the game, excepting these sequences. Um, the upbeat tones just contrast with kind of the monotony in a really interesting way. And there's a very slight escalation going on as the game progresses with fewer and fewer fish being able to per uh, evading available to purchase your Bibles or your blankets, whatever they are, pillows leading to a kind of anxiety about whether you'll make a food budget or not. Uh, I think the glitchy pixelation on the screen also escalates as the game progresses. And because this is the most challenging and repetitious of the games, I think it's also a good example of how I feel about what pretension means in these kinds of games. And that's that what I've found to be the case in indie game circles is that the games that are actually pretentious are the ones that are very on the nose and obnoxious about how they go about their individual messages like this game is about death this game is about go wanting to go out with a girl who doesn't like you this game is about I jumping off a building <laughs> anything like that whereas stuff like um, like one game that just really really bugs the hell out of me is Dark Fate um, which got like number five I think on the on an IndieGames.com awards thing. It's this really on-the-nose, obnoxious story about time travel. And it has, like, a weird art style and all that, but I don't think... That's not why I think it's pretentious. I think it's pretentious because it bangs your face with these really annoying voiceovers that kind of basically explain everything the game's about and just want you to appreciate how momentous and important it is. Whereas I think that couldn't be farther from the approach of something like La La Land or You May Nikki, um, which is very self-assured and confident, which it has to be to be able to present itself without asking, without trying to explain itself to the player at all. And that self-assuredness is ultimately kind of what I admire a lot about La La Land. I feel, um, I like La La Land a lot. I, um... But I, I also feel that there are games later on that have put its kind of a appreciation for tone and not necessarily striving to make your game the most fun thing in the world that have done it to even greater effect. Like, I really, really like um, Ten Seconds in Hell by Amy Dentata. I really, really like Problematic, which is Mary's kind of the lengthy exploration focus on something like Cyclus with the very strong appreciation for tone of something like La La Land. So it's kind of for that that I really respect these games. Is that they, they were really ahead of their time in a lot of ways. So replaying these games a couple years later after they had a very strong effect on my psyche a while back, um, I'm not sure that they have as powerful a thematic import as I thought previously, but I do admire them tremendously for just going for it in a really cool way. And if you're sitting there and thinking that this looks kind of stupid or meaningless and that you hate all these kinds of games, and that's fine, but I feel like you might be missing out on a lot of really cool experiences. La La Land represents a whole breed of games that exist almost basically singularly to share some kind of meaningful artistic truth on the part of the people who made them. And whether or not this particular example is a success to you is almost kind of irrelevant. It's That's obviously what it's trying to do, and that's what I really respect about it. I think it's a success, but... And while there's always going to be room for fun, wonderful experiences just games that are designed to entertain and bring a smile to your face and maybe tell kind of a touching story on the side. I think it's important to make room in our critical discourse and ourselves for games like La La Land and games like You May Nikki and games like Lim and games like Problematic and games, games of this type that are abstract and have more in common with like the weird 
paint weird paintings and stuff, stuff like that than movies or even books. I'm really excited about playing more games that follow in this tradition. And I sort of hope you are too. After maybe you can check out this game um, on, Anti -Pixel, on Anna Anthropy's blog post. I'll link to it in the description. And I hope you'll give it a look.